Hey everyone, my name is Rebecca Schwert and I'm currently pursuing my PhD at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. Over the next 20 minutes I will introduce you to P4TC, a provably secure yet practical privacy-preserving toll collection scheme. This is joint work with Max Hoffmann, Valerie Fetzer, Matthias Nagel and Andy Rupp. Toll collection is an already widespread and still growing practice. A study by Markets and Markets suggests the electronic toll collection market will reach more than 10 billion US dollar by 2022. Unfortunately though, most of the currently used systems inherently violate privacy, which invites misuse of collected data. For example, records from the EZPAS system employed in the US have been used as evidence in divorce lawsuits. Other examples of misused toll collection data and resulting privacy violations can be found, for instance, with the same EZPAS system throughout New York City and the AutoPass system throughout Norway. There are several different forms of toll collection systems. They can be classified by what the user is charged for, how toll charges are paid, and where, or rather how, they are determined. In distance-based tolling, the toll amount is calculated based on the distance the user travels along the roads in question. With access-based tolling, a fixed toll is set for a specific geographic area, like a city center. Both charges can be subject to other parameters like the type of vehicle, time of day and so on. Electronic toll collection systems are often prepaid, which requires users to regularly top off their account balance or run the risk of suddenly being unable to pay in the middle of a highway. But some systems also allow for more convenient post-payment options, where at the end of each billing period the user is presented with an accumulative bill of all their charges. Classically, toll is determined and collected in a toll plaza environment, which has separated lanes and toll gates. This requires traffic to slow down, increases travel time for users and frequently leads to congested roads. In open road tolling, the traffic is not disrupted. Instead, tolls are collected digitally without forcing cars to slow down. This can be achieved by three types of technologies. Automatic number plate recognition, or video tolling, is fairly easy to implement and widely used, but inherently violates privacy. Using the global navigational satellite system instead is an appealing solution because a car's onboard unit can keep track of the user's location without the need for additional infrastructure along the road. But accuracy can be a problem with this technology as you might have experienced if your car's navigation system ever told you to do a U-turn in the middle of a highway just because it suddenly detected you to be on another road close by. The most widely used electronic toll collection technology and de facto standard in Europe is dedicated short-range communication. It is based on bidirectional radio communication between the car's onboard unit and stationary roadside units. For the remainder of this talk we will concentrate on this setting. Before we go into any more detail, let me give you a brief overview of what you may expect from this talk. Firstly, we will have a look at the current scientific landscape for privacy-preserving electronic toll collection. In particular, we look at the scope of properties which prior solutions can offer and the gap they leave to fill for our P4TC system. Next, I will give you a more complete picture of the different contributions our paper contains. We will then go on to look at the specifics of the dedicated short-range communication scenario. For better comparison, we will start with the classic privacy infringing solution for this setting and derive our own P40C scenario from there. This will lead us to figure out how our P40C protocol is able to handle dispute resolution, i.e. situations in which data goes missing, users try to commit fraud or may just be falsely accused of doing so. Lastly, we examine the performance of our protocols regarding real-world efficiency. So let's look at prior solutions. We first noticed that recent scientific research on electronic toll collection mainly considers approaches via the global navigational satellite system. 
In these solutions, the user's onboard unit is equipped with GPS and typically collects time and location data or road segment prices to send through the toll service provider later on. Ensuring that users neither omit nor forge any data often relies on unpredictable spot checks. But to be a really useful deterrent, such spot checks would need to result in unrealistically high penalties or they would need to occur too frequently to still allow for adequate privacy. Additionally, they are also quite vulnerable to large-scale driver collusion, like an open access database where all the users share the locations they encountered spot checks before. Unfortunately, the dedicated short-range communication setting has received less scientific interest regarding toll collection thus far even though, as mentioned before, it is the prevalent setting today. Of those solutions which do consider dedicated short-range communication, most do not provide any post-payment options. Instead, some form of e-cash is typically used to spend coins when passing a roadside unit. In addition to the problem of always needing to have enough e-coins on hand to do so, Dynamic pricing and an impossibility result of receiving change in a privacy-preserving way mean that the user always needs the right denomination of e-coins as well. More room for improvement becomes apparent when considering how many prior solutions might intuitively offer some level of privacy and security, but actually fail to show this with any kind of proof or rigorous formal treatment. As you can see, our P40C system bridges this gap. It provides electronic toll collection in the prevalent technological setting, with convenient post-payment capabilities, and we back up our solution with a comprehensive security and privacy model and a formal proof. Furthermore, we also consider practical issues, like system failures and false accusations, which are largely ignored in scientific work, but are vital for real-world deployment of the system. The overall contribution of a paper is threefold. Firstly, we capture the specific requirements of electronic toll collection within a security and privacy model in the form of an ideal functionality FP40C. For those of you who might not be familiar with this concept, let me briefly explain how it works. An ideal functionality captures a function as if it was performed with the help of a powerful and uncorruptible trusted third party. In this ideal world of the trusted third party, the desired privacy and security properties are trivially fulfilled. In particular, our model implies a list of common security properties like anonymity, unlinkability, balance and owner binding. Now, if executions of a real protocol can be shown to be indistinguishable from this ideal version, the protocol is called a realization of the ideal functionality. As a second contribution, we develop an electronic toll collection protocol, pi P40C, and prove in the universal composability model that it actually is a realization of FP40C, meaning that it inherits all the security and privacy properties FP40C implies. Thirdly, we provide an example instantiation and implementation which we use to prove the real-world efficiency of our P40C protocol by performance measurements on realistic hardware. Before I tell you more about P40C, let me briefly explain how toll collection classically works in the dedicated short-range communication setting i.e. when you don't care about privacy. A state authority responsible for toll collection usually commissions a private company, the toll service provider. The toll service provider then installs and maintains roadside units with dedicated short-range communication capabilities. Each user has to first register their car with the toll service provider before they can participate in the system. During registration, the user is assigned a unique ID. Now whenever the user passes a roadside unit, this ID is transmitted and used to identify them. Roadside units regularly transmit all collected user IDs back to the toll service provider. He uses this information to update user accounts and facilitate billing. 
Note that the roadside units are not required to be permanently online. In particular, during the short time window of communication with a car, back-end communication with a central toll service provider would be infeasible. To deal with cars who fail to participate in a successful toll collection protocol with the roadside unit, there are usually still cameras installed further down the road. If identification via number plate lies outside the legal competence of the toll service provider, these cameras fall under the state authority's direct responsibility. Although this kind of protocol is very efficient, it does not provide any level of privacy. The user is fully identified during every interaction and can be traced at will. Our own P4TC system follows the same setup of parties, but achieves privacy by shifting most of the bookkeeping from the toll service provider to individual users. To this end, we employ user wallets, which work similar to the black box wallets you learned about in the previous talk. Instead of utilizing blind signatures like black box wallets do, we follow the commit re-randomized proof paradigm. Note that we actually cannot use black box wallets for our system, as their proof relies on the possibility to rewind the adversary, and this makes them inapplicable in the stronger UC security model we managed to achieve. So this data shift from toll service provider to users provides us with three challenges. Firstly, non-participation. While this is not really a new challenge, it takes on a new aspect. As before, we still trigger the state authority's contingency camera to take a picture of the non-participating car. This, however, is not precise enough to catch a single car only. In many situations, such a photo will show several vehicles, only one of which did not participate. We solve this problem by a protocol called proof participation between the state authority and the users in question. Secondly, a user-centric system, which is too time-sensitive to allow for online database access to some central database, always comes with double spending. That means, instead of using the most recent wallet state, which presumably has the highest collected depth, a prior, for example empty wallet, can be used without the roadside unit immediately recognizing a problem. With our double spending detection protocol, however, the toll service provider can recognize such fraudulent behavior later on. Thirdly, we need to deal with situations where data goes missing because an onboard unit breaks down or the user erases it. While data loss is also problematic in the classic solution, it is the toll service provider's fault and harm in that case, and hence is mostly ignored. In our case, on the other hand, it is vital for privacy that the toll service provider alone does not have sufficient information to identify and bill users. Hence, to deal with the situation of data going missing on the user side and recalculate the correct depth of a user and also facilitate blacklisting of repeatedly misbehaving users, we introduce an additional party, the dispute resolver. Let us look at this new party and its function in some more detail. In our system, dispute resolution encompasses blacklisting of misbehaving users as well as debt recalculation for users who are either missing their data, fail to participate in billing protocols or commit double spending. When the user is issued a new wallet by the toll service provider, it receives a secret wallet ID lambda. This wallet ID is, as a hidden trapdoor, provided to the dispute resolver in encrypted form. We therefore require the dispute resolver to not maliciously collude with the toll service provider. Now for each transaction, a roadside unit stores the respective price P, as well as a fraud detection ID phi, which is calculated as a pseudorandom function of the user's secret wallet ID lambda and their personal transaction counter X. If a user commits double spending, our double spending detection protocol will output a proof pi along with the result. The toll service provider hands this proof to the dispute resolver together with all the relevant transaction information. Now the dispute resolver firstly checks the proof to protect users from false accusations. Then decrypts the user's wallet ID lambda within the hidden trapdoor. 
With the secret wallet ID, the dispute resolver can now recalculate the pseudorandom function outputs and match them to the transaction information. These provide the individual prices and can therefore be used to recalculate the total debt owed by the user. The total debt is then handed back to the toll service provider to bill the user. So I hope this brief and necessarily incomplete insights were enough to pique your interest or maybe at least pique your doubt, as this is commonly an even stronger motivator. Um, in any case, I encourage you to have a look inside our paper and discover all the complicated little details which I kept from you. So lastly, let's have a look at how well our protocols perform on realistic hardware. For measurements on the user side, we use an IMX6 dual-core processor with 800 MHz, 1 GB RAM and 4 GB flash, which is also used in the Severi Mobile Wave 1000 onboard unit. For roadside units, we take the Econolite Connected Vehicle Coprocessor module as a reference system. And for the toll service provider's backend server, which handles wallet issuing and billing protocols, we measure on a standard laptop, although we would expect the real world toll service provider to be equipped with more powerful hardware. As you can see, both wallet issuing and debt clearance protocols take quite a lot of time, especially on the user side. Note, however, that these protocols can be handled by the onboard unit in a fully automated fashion. The user is not required to trigger them, nor to provide input or wait for their completion. The main protocol of debt collection is split into three phases. Both pre-computation and post-processing only pertain to the onboard unit of the user and can be handled outside the communication range of the roadside unit. Note that time should be sufficiently short to not interfere with the previous or subsequent transactions. For the time-critical online phase, the onboard unit and roadside unit take around 450 and 530 milliseconds respectively. While this would already be good enough, we can easily improve the user's time by caching certificates, bringing computation down to only 40 milliseconds. Even under very conservative estimates of communication range and transmission rate, this would still give us a time buffer of a whole second for the online phase. Thank you very much for listening to this talk. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to either offer them in the Q&A session or contact my colleagues and me via email.